So to so tonight's program, as I said, is about souvenir and swag from the various collections of the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission. On tonight's program, we have Linda Bola from the Erie Maritime Museum. We also have then Mrs. Uh, Sue Bates, the curator up at Drakewell Museum. Uh, say hi to Melissa for us. And then down at the Landis Valley uh, Farm and Museum, we have Jen Royer, Pennsylvania Military Museum. We have Jennifer, Cur Jennifer Glime, our curator. And then of course, Heather Hicks from Daniel Boone joining us from the hinterlands tonight because she's having some issues with uh, some internet. So she's definitely Daniel Booning it, so to speak. So with that, we'll get started and uh, we'll be going alphabetical as always. So Linda, do you mind starting us off? Oh, you're still muted there, Linda. So she's taking herself off of, there we um, go. Off of mute. So all of our attendees uh, know what's gonna happen. She's gonna unmute herself. She's gonna share her screen and she's gonna give us a five minute quick uh, rendition on some souvenirs and swag at the Erie Maritime Museum. She's then gonna hand it over to the next panelist. And then at the very end, I'm gonna turn on the poll and the competition will start for the attendees. And you can pick who's going to be the winner of tonight's program. So with, Lin with that, Linda, it's all you. Okay, well, let me share a screen here. There we go. And let's start that. Thank you, Tyler. Um, as he said, uh, I'm Linda Bola from Erie Maritime Museum. Um, I'm wondering why I'm not, there we go. Uh, there. I'm an older woman with pale complexion, blue eyes and brown hair. And I'm uh, wearing a golden straw beach hat tonight with turtle earrings uh, because I'm celebrating the 100th anniversary of Presque Isle State Park this year. And I'm going to share with you some souvenir postcards from our collection that date to about the same time as the uh, park was founded, or at least most of them do. So let's start with a card that features a cartoon map of Presque Isle State Park. The park and Lake Erie shoreline are colored yellow and the lake and bay are aquamarine. The interstate road will bring you to Erie are highlighted in green. Presque Isle's a peninsula extending north and east into Lake Erie from the west side of Erie Oversized drawings of all sorts of recreational boats are in the water here with men and women in swimsuits depicted on the beach areas. Other local points of interest such as bathhouses, lighthouses and historic monuments are all sketched in. The words Erie Vacation Land in the top left corner of this card say it all. Um, in an average summer, the park attracts over 4 million visitors from everywhere, but especially from Pittsburgh. This card was published around 1970, a couple of years after the northern extension of I-79 was completed right into Erie. And the text on the bottom edge of the postcard points to Route 79 as the best route from Pittsburgh to Presque Isle. This card is a colorized photo of number two beach and beginning of boardwalk, Erie, PA, most popular beach on the peninsula. Well, it was when this postcard was mailed in 1939, but as park roads were built and improved, the popular beaches moved further along with the road. The sandy beach in the foreground curves to the right and extends back to the horizon with a multitude of people of all ages in colorful swimsuits, enjoying a sunny day on the beach and in the water. A long white capped wave in the gray blue water to the left extends the length of the beach, ready to break on shore. Presque Isle beaches offer Pennsylvania's only surf swimming. Lush green trees stand in the top, right top quarter of the card, inviting bathers to cool off in their shade. Now the boardwalk scene here extending along the sand is no longer there, but a recently built walk and ramp at Rotary Pond Beach now makes the beach accessible to all, right up to the water's edge. Well, Presque Isle Beach is our most popular feature. The park is also known natural trails and unique habitats 
and is home to over 100 species of plants and animals. The two sepia toned photo postcards are from the personal collection of William Leverett Morrison, who helped establish Presque Isle as a state park, and he served as its first superintendent. The card on the left features one of the park's many, many walking trails. The dirt road on the right side of the image provided a comfortable stroll beside the tree-lined pond on the left. The card on the right provides a view of the park's water lily pond in the foreground, surrounded by trees on either side. Trees are reflected in the large pond, and in the center of the card is a slightly arched wooden footbridge. These postcards were used around the mid 1920s and 30s when the park was first um, made uh, an official Pennsylvania State Park. Now I'd like to share one final vintage postcard with you. This is a color tinted moonlit night view of Crystal Point showing this area of the park in the late 1920s. A break in the clouds at the top of the card reveals a full golden moon. Like so, many of Presque, uh, so much of Presque Isle, this area of the park is green with trees. Toward the left, the column of the Perry Monument to towers over the trees, glowing white in the moonlight. This monument to Oliver Hazard Perry's sailors was built in 1926. At the bottom of the card, pale blue-gray waters of Misery Bay reflect the monument, the trees, and the sky. The USS Wolverine is the side wheel paddle box steamship you see moored here. Misery Bay was the final home for this ship. Launched in 1843 as the USS Michigan, the US Navy's first iron steamer. She was renamed Wolverine shortly before she became a training vessel, vessel for Division C and D of the Naval Force of Pennsylvania, better known as the PA Naval Militia. Wolverine was a point of interest on Presque Isle until she was towed to the Breakers Yard in 1949. And so much to see, and I haven't even mentioned that the park is home to two lighthouses, houseboats, paved bicycle trails, and even has an environmental center right at the entrance. I hope you'll be sending your own souvenirs from our souvenir press, our postcards from Presque Isle State Park yourself soon. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks, Linda. That was a perfect uh, way to get us started off with the theme of tonight's souvenir and swag is how many of us always pick up those postcards when we travel. They're easy to put, put in the luggage and uh, look good on the refrigerator as well, even if you're not sending them. So uh, we'll turn it now over to uh, Sue Bates from Drakewell Museum. All right, Linda, I think you might need to start, uh, stop sharing your screen for Sue to be able to share hers. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Well, as um, most of you probably know, um, oil and gas uh, producers, if they're successful, uh, can be incredibly wealthy. I had kind of a hard time uh, selecting uh, exactly what to feature uh, because uh, obviously oil wealth brings beautiful things to the wealthy families. And many of them have been very generous to Drake Well since it opened in 1934. But I decided on the fob as one of my favorite pieces. This uh, little oval based uh, watch fob has HWP incised in Old English script on the base. And the sides rise and taper to the gold cap on top, which is a derrick and an oil tank with an engine house. Now this um, watch fob, according to our 1940 inventory, stated that it was made in 1866 for Mr. Henry W. Potter. Henry um, was a uh, oil operator in 1872, but that was an incredibly turbulent time for the industry as uh, Rockefeller and Standard Oil was being formed and slowly taking over. Uh, many of the operators shut in their wells as a, a protest against the Refiners Association. And maybe that's why Potter ends up being a superintendent of the Titusville Waterworks um, by um, 1879. He was listed as a foreman uh, in 1904 
and passed away in 1906. But the detail on this is incredibly, um, just it's, it's amazing how they were able to do it. Next to the engine house, that one round circle with the post would be the bull wheel. And the walking beam is a little oversized, but at the very top of the derrick, you can see the crown pulley. And then in front are um, barrels, barrels of oil with again, the oil tank over on the left-hand side. And this lovely piece, um, pocket watch, circular and formed, um, turn column at the top with the knurled knob. Um, when, like all pocket watches, when you push that button, it opens up to reveal the uh, Roman numerals and made by the Elgin National Watch Company. Now that watch company began in Chicago in 1864 and by the turn of the century were well known for their precision timepieces. This watch belonged to W.H. William H. Say of uh, Butler County, Jefferson Township. He was an oil and gas producer and we know that he produced gas because by 1912, he owned a casing head gasoline plant. Now casing head gasoline is produced by the natural gas rising in the oil well. It's captured, put into a series of pipes, cooled and therefore liquefied. The family also donated a hydrometer that he used to uh, do his own chemical testing uh, to measure the amount of naphtha gas uh, versus the uh, gasoline because um, you've got to have the right balance or else your automobile is going to ping, which many of them did using casing head gasoline. Uh, the family eventually moved to Zelianople and William died in 1947 and his widow Florence donated this pocket watch to the museum in 1947. Um, the hydrometer was uh, donated later on uh, that he used in his casing head gasoline plant. And we also have a piece of folk art created by one of the um, hired hands that lived with them, which hopefully I'll get to show, uh, show off in another sh uh, showcase for the collections. So that briefly is two of the bling pieces that we have at Drake Well Museum. Thank you so much, Sue. I would say that uh, another swag item might be right now the five gallon jerry can as we see folks uh, starting to stock up on some gas down in the uh, north or southwestern part of southeastern part of the United States right now. Sorry about the colonial pipeline issues going on. Um, gotcha. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you so much, Sue. Wonderful stuff, especially that pocket watch. Uh, Jen Royer down at Landis Valley. We'll get down to the southeastern part of Pennsylvania now. All right, before I show you my souvenir artifact from Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum collection, I must say one thing. I believe that every curator has a certain type of artifact that is not their favorite. They don't open the drawer that is in, they walk by the boxes on the shelves as they try to forget what is inside. And after almost 20 years as a curator at two institutions, a private nonprofit and with the PHMC at Landis Valley, this is my least favorite artifact. I avoid it at all costs. In fact, I made this presentation, photograph the object without ever touching them. However, this repulsion is a 21st century problem. And these artifacts were very common souvenirs filled with love and not unusual at all in the 19th century. For generations, parents have been saving their children's locks of hair. My mother has my first cur curl and I have my children's. Henry Harrison Landis, the father of four children, including the founders of Landis Valley, Henry and George Landis, carried his children's hair around with him in his wallet. He labeled them on pieces of paper, which he wrapped the locks in. On the left, it reads, boy's hair, age six weeks. On the right, 11 months. We don't know which boy the hair on the left belongs to, and if possibly the hair on the right belongs to one of the girls, Anna Marguerite, who died as a child, or Nettie, who was born 12 years after her brothers and was everyone's favorite. The Victorians, however, took this tradition for me an uncomfortable step further. 
During the Victorian era, which was 1837 to 1901, during Queen Victoria's reign, women would indulge in what was known as fancy work. One form of this fancy work was making ornate creations from hair that was woven around thin wire. That's right, hair. These are all hair wreaths. Two of them are horseshoe shaped for good luck. The open ends facing up to catch the luck. Originally, hair wreaths were made from the hair of one person, a deceased loved one, making the piece an object of mourning and using it as an honor, remembrance, and souvenir. It allowed the survivors to retain a physical remnant of somebody once they were gone. Hair does not decay like flesh or bones, making it the perfect souvenir of great grandma. Queen Victoria's lifelong period of mourning after her husband's death started a number of cultural mourning practices like wearing black and creating items or souvenirs to remember a loved one with. Queen Victoria wore a locket with her husband's hair in it is eventually involved into making of these wreaths. Women then started taking locks from multiple family members, dead or alive, and weaving them into one design, creating sentimental family trees. Different colors were achieved by using different shades of hair. Horse hair was sometimes used when they did not have enough hair available to them. Women could also purchase strands of hair from catalogs, women's magazines, and local stores. The finished wreaths were then often given as gifts. Smaller wreaths were sent to family members who lived far away as a memento, memento or souvenir of their loving family. Because it was considered an art form, women were taught how to do this craft in the same way they learned cooking, sewing, and cleaning. Bodie's Ladies Book provided detailed instructions on how to create a Victorian hair wreath. The self-instructor in the art of hair work published in 1867, and a catalog from the National Artistic Hair Work Company also offered patterns and detailed instructions. Whether using a pattern or not, women would use wire to form the hair into delicate designs of flowers, flowers, sprigs, and leaves. Wooden or glass beads, buttons, and sometimes seeds were included in the final design. Hair wreaths were used to commemorate and remembering living or dead loved ones. Every meticulous knot in a strand or delicate petal of a flower formed with hair and wire reflects an intimate connection between the artist and the subject that acted as both a portrait and a souvenir of the relationship and love. Thank you so much, uh, Jen. I, would, I was gonna ask you if you can find these at the wonderful gift shop of uh, handmade <laughs> items from Landis Valley, but I dare not ask such a hairy question. Um, so I had to do it. it, it the, the pun was there and I had to step through it. Uh, we'll now take it uh, up to central Pennsylvania to, uh, to Jen Gleim, to Pennsylvania Military Museum. So Jen, you're up. Can everybody hear me now? Okay. So before I start, I want to preface my presentation by saying that it contains an image that might be upsetting to some people, but I think I think what I'm about to share with you has a very important and poignant story. So I'll I hope you'll listen with an open mind. Um, during World War II, as in many previous wars. Soldiers often brought home souvenirs of their time overseas to commemorate their part in the war. World War II was no different. So what I'm gonna talk about tonight is a signed banner. As you can see, it's a, a banner from the Third Reich. It's 10 feet long and four feet wide, and it's signed by all of the members of the 28th Division Quartermaster Company. The men collected the banner you can see here um, in Belgium. 20th Division Quartermaster Company was part of the Pennsylvania, 20th Division Pennsylvania National Guard. 
Quartermaster units were responsible for acquiring and distributing supplies, including ammunition, food, clothing, and fuel, um, all the things that were necessary to sustain combat operations. They also had another important duty, and that was to uh, process the information and personal belongings of soldiers who were killed in action. So they, uh, they were very important. Um, they arrived with the rest of the 28th Division in Europe in October 1943, and they continued to support the division as it moved across Europe. And like I said, this banner was collected from a former German barracks near the Belgian border as the division was entering Germany um, in October 1944. And you can see there's a few photos here that were taken by uh, the unit, the company commander, John Sees. Um, both these photos were taken in Germany and they show some of the men uh, from the quartermaster company uh, at work. The banner is important for several reasons. Um, one of the things that the Third Reich did as they continued to push across Europe was destroy or confiscate the cultural property of nations and peoples that they occupied. Um, they did this for several reasons. Uh, the biggest one, which was to consolidate their power and to try and crush opposition. Um, it was very destructive, obviously, and really, really damaging to nations and people throughout Europe. As the Allies fought their way across Europe and into Germany, one of the things that they were that they did was tore down symbols of the Third Reich, including banners, insignia. They tore images from buildings and trains. Um, these symbols, these objects, symbolized the hatred, intolerance, and totalitarianism that was characteristic of Hitler's government. And on top of that, it was. Uh, was very, very empowering to the Allied soldiers to remove those symbols as their own personal mementos of the role that they played in saving Europe from Hitler's control. Um, the men of the 28th Division were very proud of this banner. Um, it came to us from one of the men who served in the quartermaster company. His widow donated it to the museum in the 1980s. Um, they all signed it. There's actually a second one in the collection of the museum that belonged to the company commander himself, a smaller flag that was also signed by all of the, uh, all of the men in the unit. And 63 years later, in 2007, one of the men who signed that banner came to the museum to see it. His name was Blair Brumbaugh, and he was from Huntington. He served as a truck driver with the 20th Division Quartermaster Company. And he had forgotten all about the banner until a friend of his mentioned that he had seen it at the museum. Uh, Mr. Brumbaugh's family arranged to have him come to the museum and see the banner. And when he did, it brought tears to his eyes as he talked with our educator, Joe, about his memories of the war. So even many years later, a symbol that that was once associated with hate brought back very intense memories for this man of the role that he played in the liberation of Europe. Thanks so much, Jen. I think it's a, a poignant remind, reminder of the evil that exists in the world. And by reminding us of it, we all know what, uh, what these men and women fought against to ensure that the uh, freedoms and liberties of others, even thousands of miles away, was, was protected and ensured. So thank you so much. Uh, Dan Daniel Boone Homestead, so Heather Hicks, you're up. So from the, uh, the hinterlands, I know we're having some internet is issues. So if we can help you, uh, Heather, from our side, just let us know and we'll be sure to grab our buckskin and our, uh, our extra flint flintlocks and head your direction. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm sorry to everyone. The video I had prepared was, uh, is not cooperating with our lack of internet. So we're, 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 we're kind of putting some things together in the end. But uh, what I have with me today is our 11 inch tall polyplastic Mark's Daniel Boone action figure from 1965. 
And uh, this doll was designed by Lewis Marks Company, who was founded in Erie, Pennsylvania in 1919. Uh, and they were primarily a toy manufacturer. And uh, by the 1950s, they actually produced about 20% of all the toys in the U.S. And uh, in fact, I think in 1955, Time Magazine declares them the king of toys. And starting in the 50s and 60s, um, Marx wanted to create a uh, series of play sets and action figures to um, compete with their competitor Hasbro, who started designing the very successful G.I. Joe line at that time. But uh, Marx Brothers, but Marx, not brothers, sorry, Marx, this company decided to base theirs off of uh, several current TV shows and uh, historical figures, which included uh, Roy Rogers Ranch Rodeo, Gunsmoke, and of course, NBC's Daniel Boone, the rippinest, roaringest, fightinest man on the frontier ever knew. And uh, the TV show actually runs from uh, 1964 to 1970, and it focused on the Boone family and the exploration and surveying around uh, Boonesboro, Kentucky, that happened uh, before and during the Revolutionary War. Uh, this doll was actually designed in 1965 and was uh, uh, designed uh, or, or cre created the year after the start of the popular program. And of course, its head was modeled off of Fess Parker, who, of course, played Daniel Boone. Now, Fess Parker had actually uh, played Davy Crockett uh, to great acclaim in the Walt Disney anthology series. And that actually led to uh, two Disney movies, uh, Davy Crockett and the King of the Wild Frontier and Davy Crockett and the River Pirates. And he had actually hoped to play the, the character again. Uh, and when NBC had approached him about doing a, a, fly, a weekly television show, uh, they were very keen to bring back uh, Daniel Boone to the small screen. Now, unfortunately, Disney was not willing to sell the rights. So that led Parker to another famous frontiersman, Daniel Boone. So Daniel, uh, Daniel Boone here is, as I said, uh, addressed as Fess Parker uh, would have it. And because of some of the, um, because of Daniel, of, of Fess Parker playing both Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, a lot of the uh, confusion between the two figures uh, exists. Um, in addition to uh, being, at, sharing the same actor, Fess Parker also uh, decided to have a similar costume for uh, each of them, which of course included a buckskin outfit and a, a coonskin cap. Now, despite my headwear this evening, Daniel Boone never wore a coonskin cap. He thought they were impractical. He thought they were hot, clumsy, and instead he would wear a uh, wide brim uh, beaver felt hat uh, that would shed water easily. Now, luckily, the Daniel Boone doll, who does come with a uh, completely equipped for the wilderness, uh, in addition to his coonskin cap, for a more accurate portrayal, you can put uh, a, 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 a another hat on him. Although, to be honest, this does look a bit like a uh, cowboy hat but we'll let that go. Of course, he also comes equipped with a pelt of furs, a lovely bearskin jacket to wear at night on the cold frontier, and his Pennsylvania long rifle to hold uh, to keep him safe in the frontier. Ultimately, um, Daniel Boone doll was uh, incredibly popular and would have been uh, completely at home with any boy visiting the Daniel Boone homestead. And that is what I have for you tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. I do think that Daniel Boone would give Jeremiah Johnson a run for his money at any moment with his Kentucky long rifle versus the, uh, the 50 cow that uh, of course was used in the movie. Well, thank you so much panelists and, uh, and attendees for, for joining us this evening. Our next stop, our step is to actually do the polling. 
So what I'm gonna ask everybody to do is I'm turning the polling question on right now. The launch poll has, the poll has been launched. So if you go down to your um, little buttons there as the attendees, you'll find that poll. And uh, the questions, of course, being, or the question being, which object presented by our panelists best represented the theme of souvenirs and swag? So what you have to choose from tonight, folks, again, is the Pennsylvania Military Museum's World War II souvenirs, the Erie Maritime Museum's Battle of Lake Erie souvenir, or the, the postcards, I believe, I'm sorry, the hair wreaths of Landis Valley Village Farm and Museum, the Daniel Boone Homestead pop culture object, the action figure, almost like uh, Chuck Norris's action jeans, and you also have Drakewell Museum's Park, the watch, fob, and necklace. So you have those objects to choose from. And again, which object presented by our panelists best represented the theme? So we almost have, almost have everybody have, has voted, but not quite yet. We'll leave it up for just a little bit longer. Um, so folks, if you're still joining us and you're, you haven't left us yet on the Facebook side or on the Zoom side, um, again, in the chat box, some, un, uh, some wonderful banter back and forth, but one of the most important parts probably is if you find the, uh, the, the, the chat part from uh, Amy Fox, where she uh, provides you with a link, www.patrailsofhistory.com. That's where you can find all of the PHMC historic sites and museums, and even the ones tonight from the Mil Military Museum, Erie Maritime Museum, Drakewell, Landis Valley, and of course, Daniel Boone, and all of those websites. Uh, seemed like today we're working. We had a few of our sites, how about it, that were down because of uh, some lemmings chewing on the internet lines. But we always we always make do and overcome. So we got 83% people voted. I get a few more minutes uh, for folks to find that poll button. But, uh, but panelists, it's been fun as far as learning about a hair wreath. I was actually curious when I saw that was one of the items. What is a hair wreath? I was very familiar with mooring items, of course, but I did not know about hair wreaths. And uh, I thought the, the Drakewell Museum uh, brass um, topper, so to speak, was really interesting because the amount of detail in that carving. Uh, and of course, Daniel Boone, I mean, let's be serious. Every little kid, especially little boys, we all have our coonskin hats like, like Boone. And Linda, uh, I recognize some of your postcards actually from being out on Presque Isle, but I don't know if some of them were near where that re the, the diner is at the end of the point there, but, but uh, nonetheless, it's still worth seeing. And of course, the stories of these guys and gals bringing home the, uh, the souvenirs of World War II to let us know why they, why they fought, as the Band of Brothers would say, and where they fought as well. well I think that's probably enough time for, uh, for everybody to vote. You've heard my voice long enough tonight, I understand. Uh, and with that, I'll close the poll. So tonight's winner, I will say it is not the military museum. Although we did win in the past, it is not us. It is not the Erie Maritime Museum. I'm very sorry, Linda. Heather, I'm very sorry. It's not Daniel Boone Homestead. Although I do wanna see if he does the, the judo chop like Chuck Norris's uh, action figure. Oh yes, that's awesome. Drakewell, I'm very sorry. It is Landis Valley's, the hair wreaths have, has won tonight. So uh, if you would, on your way out of Landis Valley uh, Museum and Park, be sure to stop by the gift shop, pick up your hair wreath. It'll be nicely packaged in some uh, hair wreath tissue paper for you. And uh, we'll be sure to hang that above your mantle. So uh, Jen uh, Royer, any parting thoughts or any parting words before we, we head out for the evening? I hope to never look at the hair wreaths again, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations uh, to, to Landis Valley. Thank you so much panelists for joining us and uh, look forward to, of course, yet another PHMC collection showcase next month. And Jen, you guys won again. So I guess you have to, to host again. Yeah, I have to tell David. I mean, I don't know. It's good to win, not good to win. I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everybody. Again, if you're on Facebook, it's been downloaded as well as on Zoom, it's been downloaded. So if you've missed it this evening, we'll be able to get that posted up for you and we'll get it out to all the sites. Thanks again, congratulations, Jen, down at Atlantis Valley. Thank See you. See everybody. <laughs>